You're listening to the Whole Hog Football Podcast, sponsored by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. Every Monday through Friday during the Razorbacks football training camp, bringing you the latest news, position analysis, and more. Here's your hosts, Matt Jones and Scotty Bordelon. Razorbacks went through their final scrimmage of the preseason on Saturday. Sounded like it was a little bit more balanced of a scrimmage uh, than they had in, in the first week. We'll go through what Sam Pittman had to talk about on Saturday after they scrimmaged inside Razorback Stadium as we go throughout this podcast. Matt Jones with Scotty Bordelon and Andrew Joseph of WholeHogSports.com. We'll play some of Sam Pittman's comments from following the scrimmage here in just a moment. But Scotty, what were your takeaways as you listened to him talk on Saturday afternoon about what they went through? The, the assumption is that it was probably about the same length of a scrimmage as they'd gone through the week before, which I think was, I don't know, somewhere around 110, 130 plays, uh, probably about the same length just in, in terms of when they started, when he came in. Uh, seemed like he was happier with some elements. And obviously, I guess the the big story would be that he was a little bit, I don't know if concern's the right word, but uh there's some some things going on with the offensive line players out uh, that at least has his attention. Yeah, it sounds like the offensive line's a little bit banged up. Um, I don't know. That's not exactly the greatest place in to be less than two weeks out from your season opener. But you know, Ricky Stromberg needs to be healthy. I think that's that's pretty clear because it, you know, Pittman gave Patrick Kudis. Um, you know, a lot of credit the other day for stepping in after Ricky Stark went down. But we also heard that there were lots of lots of balls on the ground, like um, you know, between center and, and and quarterback, and that's not you know that's never a good thing. And I think that that right there just goes to show you the value that that Ricky Stromberg has. That guy's got to be really healthy for I think your your offensive line to you know to play at its peak and play at its best. Um, other than that, you know. I think it's, it's a good thing for Arkansas's quarterbacks to come out of the scrimmage clean. It doesn't sound like there were any interceptions. Defense maybe gave up fewer explosive plays than in the first scrimmage, which I think is what you want to see if, if you're Dominic Bowman and and Barry Odom. It's not, the, the the receivers clearly won the won the first scrimmage. I mean, Hazelwood, Landers, Warren Thompson, Keytron Jackson, you name it, they all had big plays. Um, there were some big plays, obviously, in um, in the second scrimmage. But I think the thing that stuck out to me was, you know, when Sam got asked who made big plays or what were the big plays in the second scrimmage, he kind of went to um, the defensive side of the ball before he finished. Um, and that, that production came in the form of a couple second-team defensive ends that – you know, you went out and got from the transfer portal that you were hoping that can, you know, help you right away. That's Landon Jackson and Jordan Dominic. Um, so I think that was, I think that was really good to hear. And then, you know, it seems like every time we talk to Sam, he he gives a shout out to Terry Hampton. That happened again on Saturday. So I think you're, um, I think you're you're seeing some guys on the defensive line starting to starting to really step up and kind of make their presence felt. And just to go through this, I mean, these are the injuries that we know about on the offensive line. Pittman said Saturday that Ricky Stromberg had to leave the practice early because he had what he said was probably a hyperextended elbow. Doesn't think that's going to be a, <clears throat> a serious injury, but it was something that happened, and, and they've got some issues going on with some of their backup centers that, as Scotty was talking about, it made Patrick Kutas uh, have to play second string when Sam Pittman said that in all reality he's probably about – uh, their number six center on the team. Of course, Marcus Henderson's been out for most of this camp, if not all of it, with a pectoral injury. He's been uh, going through drills, but in a green no-contact jersey for the most part. Um, let's see who else. Tackle uh, Devin Manuel. Uh, he's probably about a week away from being back. Pittman said he's been out for more than a week. Uh, we don't know what that injury is, but uh, Pittman did say that he thinks that Devin Manuel and Marcus Henderson probably will be available on the on September 3rd when they play Cincinnati and then Josh Street who has been uh, the backup center for most of this camp a redshirt uh, I believe he's a redshirt freshman out of Bentonville uh, has been battling an ankle injury so those are some of the <clears throat> some of the things that are going on with the offensive line you know I think that you expect some some dings if you will on the offensive line throughout camp and and I asked Sam this 
point blank Saturday, I said, is this a concern for you? And he said, it, it's not really a concern. Uh, I don't even think he said the word yet, but he, he said, it's not really a concern that they think they're going to be able to have most of not all of these players back by the time that uh, they play Cincinnati in less than two weeks. Now, uh, some of the big plays Scotty hit on some of these, but it, it's a closed scrimmage. So the, the big plays come from what we're told, whether that be by, uh, the sports information directors or Sam Pittman himself. And uh, these were some of the big plays that were mentioned on Saturday said that uh, Raheem Sanders, Rocket Sanders had a couple of big plays, a 30 yard catch, a 15 yard run. Uh, so there was a, a red zone touchdown by Nathan Bax that he said was a nice play. Uh, Matt Landers, Sam and Quincy McAdoo all had touchdown catches. Pittman said that uh, there was a separate 25 yard catch by McAdoo uh, that was a, a play that stood out to him. There was a touchdown run by Jefferson. Of course, he's wearing a no-contact jersey. Uh, a couple of plays that Pittman seemed to highlight that he, he really liked was a 25-yard pass from K.J. Jefferson to Warren Thompson, a long pass from uh, Malik Hornsby to Keetron Jackson. And, uh, you know, a lot of those are, are names that that we've heard throughout both of these scrimmages and that we've seen with our own eyes when the practices are open. And you're, you're getting kind of a an idea now of who the playmakers are going to be on this team, I think. I think what's so hard about hearing about these scrimmages rather than watching them is that you have to take these big plays with a grain of salt because you're not really sure how it went down. And and I think Sam Pittman said yesterday that if anybody gets within three feet of KJ, they blow the play dead. And so I'm kind of wondering how, how much different it'll be come week one when the quarterback's allowed to run and take a hit. And I guess, I guess these scrimmages, you would hope that the defense wins considering they, they don't really have to, sack the quarterback necessarily to stop the play but they just have to get near him at least well and the yeah. other thing we don't know scotty is is are they going ones on ones ones on twos right two? we, we don't know any of that yeah that's what i was about to say too like i think it's 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 always good to see you know malik and, and kj having good days passing the ball and obviously kj running the ball too on that touchdown run that he had um, Kyle Parkinson, the sports information director, he said that KJ wasn't touched, so it was a, it was a pretty clean score. He would have, you know, he would have gotten into the end zone anyway, um, even if he was live, um, available to be hit. But we don't like with Warren Thompson's touchdown, Keytron's touchdown, um, any any, you know, any score with Landers, Quincy McAdoo, you know, Hazelwood. We don't know who is, you know, who's in coverage against those guys, like. For instance, one Warren, one of Warren Thompson's touchdowns, it could have been Kari Johnson, who's like a second or third team corner, um, maybe in that fourth spot. Sometimes could have been Kewan Parker, might have been, you know, it could have been Hudson Clark for all that we know. Like, and if it was against Hudson Clark, you know, it probably holds a little bit more weight than it does against Kewan Parker, who you know he by and large had a really good spring, but he's not fighting for, you know, meaningful significant snaps right now. Um, so I think that's that's what makes a big difference. And I think Tom on Saturday, uh, when we got the the lowdown on all of the big plays that happened, I think he he asked who Rocket had all of his success against in the in the first series of the scrimmage, and it came against the second team. So, like in my mind, you're starting the scrimmage off without knowing anything, being there. I was thinking that for, you're going to start the scrimmage off first team offense against first team defense, but it was first team offense against the second team defense. Um, doesn't really make a big difference to me with with Rocket doing that. Like I know what Rocket can do, but I think it's um, I think it's a little bit more telling when um, we know like who these matchups were. Because um, I know Quincy McAdoo had a had a good had a good scrimmage the other day. It was probably against like some second second team guys at best third team guys um i think he's a guy that's in a position to travel um but he, so he's making plays against pretty much anybody but yeah it would be um it'd be great to watch some of these scrimmages but uh we don't and um those are those are the big plays it sounds like some of the same names are, are seemingly making plays every weekend we'll know soon enough uh when they play cincinnati in about 12 days. Uh, I'm guilty of this too, uh, but, but Sam Pittman has a tendency sometimes to start a thought and not completely finish it. Uh, and he kind of did that Saturday. He was talking about KJ Jefferson and the indication that I got Scotty was that he was talking about how maybe Jefferson and, and, and I want your, your thoughts on this, but it seemed like he was talking about how Jefferson may be more uh, willing to stay in the pocket and throw now than he was a year ago and maybe he's not as as quick a foot to to get out to the pocket and run 
you know, maybe let a play develop a little bit more. Uh, he did have a comment. He said, this is going to be a much different offense than it was last year uh, in, in reference to KJ Jefferson leading the offense. And, and then he had a good quote. I thought he said, uh, we didn't know what we had going into the rice game last year, referencing the <clears throat> 2021 season opener. He said, we know what we have this year with, with Jefferson. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that, that was a super interesting comment. It's going to be a much different looking offense. Um, I think KJ this year is just completely more co- confident, like Sam said, and comfortable just with himself. And I think he knows that he's got more weapons around him this year. So maybe that gives him a little bit more confidence to to stay in the pocket longer. Another part of this is he's super confident in his offensive line too. And I think that it, it, whenever a quarterback feels fine standing in the pocket, maybe a little bit longer than he's accustomed, like maybe become accustomed to last year, or, you know, he's got more time now than he ever has. Um, I think that tells you a little bit about the offensive line for sure. And I think last year it was like KJ would get to snap, look for a receiver if Traylon's not open. Yeah, I might tuck this thing and run because that's probably your second best option on any play last year other than maybe turning around and handing the ball to Dominic Johnson. But now he's just got options. And I think um, I think one way that I think he's just got so much more trust in the guys that are that are on the perimeter making plays for him this year. And that that makes sense. And I think they really want him to, if possible, not tuck the ball and run as much just to save his body a little bit um, just because I think they know how precious, um, you know, the time he has on the field is. And, you know, if if Malik Hornsby has to come in, it definitely changes a whole lot of things. Um, so I just – I think it's a, a combination of all those things, but mainly just, you know, KJ being more confident in his playmakers and uh, I think his offensive line. I engaged Pittman in some offensive line talk after the scrimmage on Saturday – you know, I always talk about this during the preseason, but I remember when he was the offensive line coach from 2013 to 15 at Arkansas, I think he would say something like, you know, 10 to 15, 10 to 14 days, something like that before the first game, you want to know who your top eight offensive linemen are. So basically, obviously have your starting five in place and then know who are those three guys that you can count on to come in and plug holes if there is an injury along the offensive line. So I asked him on Saturday, you know, who were the top eight offensive linemen Uh, Four, we know who they are. They're the returning starters, Lemmer, Stromberg, Latham, and Wagner. Uh, You can throw Luke Jones into that mix because he's a a veteran, obviously battled for a starting job last year. It's probably going to be their starting left tackle this year. And then of course we think that Tykes Crawford is going to at minimum split snaps with Dalton Wagner at at right tackle. So there's six who you know who they are pretty well off the bat it was interesting to me that he said uh, number seven and eight right now are probably Marcus Henderson and Devin Manuel who have not you know been able to practice uh, you know at least to to their fullest potential uh, throughout this preseason Uh, after that it was interesting he said Andrew Chambly might be number nine Uh, and then you know he listed off some other players who he thought could probably play but there's there's a dip between uh, those first eight or nine and and these and those are Jalen St. John I think I said his last name wrong earlier. Patrick Kudas, uh, the the freshman. Uh, Josh Street, we mentioned him. And Marion Harris, another freshman. Uh, this was Pittman's quote. He said, after eight, we get pretty young. That doesn't mean we get bad. It just means that they're inexperienced. Interesting to hear his thoughts on the offensive line. Yeah, something about that answer that intrigues me is uh, Jalen St. John not being in that top eight um, just because he was a guy that entered the portal last year and Sam Pittman actually talked him out of it and he rejoined the team. And so I would have thought that he would maybe be in contention for more significant playing time than he appears to be. And now it appears he's in a battle for that backup left guard spot with uh, the freshman kudos. I think our Arkansas has got some good backup options, like with Tykes Crawford, a backup that a lot of teams in the league would like to have. And Marcus Henderson, you know, I can't honestly say that I've watched him just a whole awful lot whenever he's been on the field. But I think there's a a really good reason why they've been – I don't want to say just like babying him along, but just like making sure that he's completely healthy. And it's been interesting, you know, going to practice and seeing – 
Marcus last week was the only player on the whole team that was outside on the practice fields, obviously could have been somebody um, who was like not present or doing rehab inside. And I just didn't see him. He was the only one wearing a green, no contact top on the whole team last week. And throughout the, throughout the fall, he's been getting some individual attention, just, you know, like 10 or 15 feet away from the rest of the offensive line. And so I think it's interesting that he's getting that work in while he's, you know, recovering from that peck. You've got to have, you got to have solid, healthy pecs to to play on the offensive line. You just got to, um, you know, that's the part of your body where, you know, you kind of generate a lot of your strength uh, and your power and, you know, God forbid something happens to Ricky Stromberg, they need to have Marcus Henderson healthy. And I think, um, I think they've done a, a pretty good job of, of bringing him along at a, at a solid pace. Let's listen to some more from what Sam Pittman had to say Saturday. I think we've got a pretty good football team. Uh, when you have problems on the football team is when they won't run to the ball, uh, when they won't strain on their blocks when you don't have talent to throw or catch it, when you don't have talent to cover somebody. Now, those are when you have problems on the football, when you have guys that don't want to be on the team and are, 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 are problems in the locker room. That's when you have problems in a locker room or in a, on a team, and we don't have that. So everything we, we are doing, we can fix if we have – and it's just the little details we, you know, we had – uh, some offsides on the offensive line. We we had a hard time on offense protecting uh, at times. Uh, there was a lot of good things as well on offense, but uh, those details, you know, we got beat deep a couple of times on some balls. Uh, those details, uh, technique and things that we've got to get better at, but we don't have a problem with unity and we don't have a problem with chasing the ball and straining on offense. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things that I thought he talked about on Saturday, Scotty, was the, the cornerback play. And he said that he thought Hudson Clark was their best cornerback through two weeks. And I think that surprises some people with, you know, who else they have on the team. Obviously, they brought in uh, Dwight McLaughlin, who, you know, comes with a lot of fanfare from LSU. Uh, he said that uh, Saturday, though, Clark and Bishop were their starting cornerbacks. And then he said there's basically four other cornerbacks who are battling for playing time, those being uh, McLaughlin. Uh, Malik Chavis, Kari Johnson, and Kewan Parker. Yeah, isn't it interesting? Hudson Clark's just hanging on, man. And I remember last week we talked to Scott Fountain, and we, like us three, talked about Reed Bauer, how Arkansas has brought in guys at his position that, you know, going into camp, we're probably like, yeah, Reed Bauer's probably not beating him out. And Reed's probably going to be watching, you know, quite a bit from the side while, you know, somebody else – has the job that he wants. And I think like every, like at least the last two seasons, maybe longer, like that's been at least the last two seasons, that's been Hudson Clark for sure. Like he's just, he's doing whatever he can to hold on to that job. And Jalen Catalan said the other day after the scrimmage that he's got four picks in the fall through, I think 13 or 14 practices. And that I would imagine that has to lead all of the defensive backs um, he should have had five because, you know, there was one pick that um, he couldn't quite reel in because he was wearing boxing gloves like Tuesday or Wednesday last week. So he's just – I think he's just really active. And I remember talking to his dad a couple years ago for a story after he kind of became a national story for that three-pick game. And he said that everybody wants to pick on Hudson until they realize he can jump. And one of the things I think he does really well is he doesn't get beat over the top a lot. Like he might give up some – 8, 10, 12, 14 yard stuff, you know, maybe a little bit more often than you'd like, but I think the technique is pretty sound to where he's not like, you're not going to get to say the name on the back of his Jersey for the wrong reasons. And I'm uh, so kind of on a side note opposite Hudson. I'm not sold that Ladarius Bishop's going to be the guy. I think it's going to be Malik Chavis or Dwight McLaughlin. I think it's, I think it's honestly a battle between those two guys and that could be me being naive and not fully informed because I don't get to watch just a ton of practice. But um, I think, I think Chavis and, and McLaughlin are, are clearly the, uh, the superior options there opposite Hudson. Yeah. I think we've talked a little bit about how Hudson Clark is uh, kind of a, a target for some criticism that may be unwarranted. And I think when you 
take into consideration that he's a guy that really was never supposed to be in this position to be a starting cornerback at Arkansas. Uh, that criticism is probably a little overbearing. And I think if you're going to have that anger, it should be directed maybe more towards the coaching staff than the player himself. Because if you're one, if you're getting one thing from Hudson Clark, it's that he's going to give it his all. And I mean, if he's the guy the coaching staff thinks is going to give them the best chance to win, that's a, an indictment on the coaching staff and, and the guys that they're bringing in behind them as well. You know, it might not be the same like for previous coaching staffs, like under Chad Morris. We just kind of had an idea that he was a little bit in over his head sometimes. And I didn't always feel like he was playing his best options. Like I think Jalen Catalan early in his career was a prime example of that. Like he was making plays in practice like every day, and he's not playing because he's, I don't know, wasn't old enough yet. Um, but I think there's, I think this coaching staff led by Sam has built enough trust with the fan base that whoever they roll out there on Saturdays, they know is the best option because I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust the coaching staff who sees practice every day, analyzes film every day, breaks it down and understands who their best talent is over, you know, I get to see a little bit of practice throughout the week, but probably not nearly as much as them to make a, you know, a, a you know, a coherent decision. Um, and I think that's, I think that's where fans kind of have to sit back and be like, okay, well, I guess that, that makes sense. I don't see practice. The coaches see it every single day. And, you know, when they go back and watch film, they can watch the practice two or three times probably. And they understand who the best players are. Um, and those coaches, like their jobs are on the line. They're not going to play guys that, you know, don't deserve to be playing. They're going to play their best options. I think that's that should be pretty clear. Um, I think Hudson is, is clearly their top option at one of the corners. Yeah, it's it's their livelihood. It's, it's a pretty big deal uh, that they're putting on, on who to play. Uh, just going to empty out the notebook here. Uh, some of the other things that I had written down after Saturday, Scotty mentioned Landon Jackson and Jordan Dominic. Sam Pittman uh, also mentioned Dorian Gerald is having a, a solid practice as a defensive end. Of course, Gerald didn't go through spring practice, really didn't get to uh, practice you know, much at all because of the, the timing of his injury last regular season. So I think there's kind of a reacclimation process with him. Uh, it seems like maybe he's starting to, to come around to, to what they're hoping to see. Uh, had written down here that Arkansas didn't have any kickoffs out of bounds on Saturday. That was something that Pittman had said. Uh, had frustrated him in the first scrimmage, uh, kind of indicated that Jake Bates had more kickoffs out of bounds, if, if not all the kickoffs out of bounds in that first scrimmage, uh, said that Cam Little is the leading candidate to be the kickoff guy right now. But he did say he thought that Scott Fountain wants Bates to be the kickoff guy if they can get him to be more consistent. Uh, that way they can keep Little focusing on on field goals and extra points. Uh, said so that Isaiah Satania and Bryce Stevens are in a couple of position battles. Uh, first as a, a second team slot receiver. Uh, also said that they're really battling to be the team's starting punt returner. And then he had some notes on some injuries. Uh, said that uh, Jaden Wilson's out right now, uh, nursing a, an injury to the AC joint in one of his shoulders. He's not expected to be out for very long. Marcus Miller, who had a knee scope earlier in preseason practice, uh, he's going to be back probably by the middle. Uh, part of this week, uh, if if not late this week, as they start to get into their Cincinnati prep. I believe that begins on Thursday. They're going to have kind of a longer prep week for Cincinnati as they transition out of camp mode. Um, said Devin Manuel probably is about a week away. This was as of Saturday uh, from getting back. And that Dominic Johnson and Marcus Henderson are going to start doing some individual work this week uh, to see where exactly they are from the sounds of it. It sounds like Henderson uh, is closer to coming back uh, than Johnson is. Pittman had previously said that uh, he hoped Johnson might be back uh, somewhere around week three, uh, basically had ruled him out for week one and week two against Cincinnati and South Carolina. Uh, but he has previously said that he thinks Johnson will play the majority of the season. And then one other one, uh, Torian Carter, uh, was there at, he was asked about Torian Carter and he just said Torian's going to be out for a minute so read into that what you will I think all of us are of the belief that Torian Carter's probably going to be out for most if not all the season Scotty yeah anytime you say a guy's going to be out for a minute uh don't believe it's actually a minute it's going to be quite a bit longer um, and that's just that's really unfortunate for for Torian he really was having a, a terrific spring and I was excited about the the potential of 
you know, him and Isaiah Nichols in the middle of that defensive line. And then, you know, guys like Campbell maybe filling in behind them. Um, yeah, just kind of, it sucks for Torian for sure, but it sounds like he's been in pretty good spirits and, you know, I think Isaiah Nichols maybe said the other day that he's still been around practice and in meetings as if he was playing. Like the only difference is like he's not in pads and he's not on the field with them. So he's still there being um, as good of a leader as he can. And I think Dominic Johnson has been doing a lot of that same things too. And um, Jimmy Smith spoke a couple of weeks ago just about how he's just really trying to keep Dominic's mind sharp. Like he's keeping or he's giving him responsibilities like as soon as um, – running backs all get in their position meeting room. You know, I think Jimmy Smith's got Dominic Johnson, you know, he's given him a responsibility to to text him and be like, hey coach, everybody's here. Um, everybody's taped up, ready to go to practice. Like he's he's in charge of of several different things. Um keeping his mind fresh. And then, you know, obviously um he's do I think he's been doing some work that we haven't been able to see. So his legs are probably a little bit more fresh than everybody thinks they are. Um, obviously still, still working his way back, but it, it'll be good to see Dominique um, just back on the field, back with the guys. And he'll probably feel like, you know, a little bit more of a part of the team. And I think that's, that's really good from a, from a psyche standpoint. Pittman said before the practices began that there were going to be some players that he kept on the preseason roster. You can only have, so many that go through preseason camp and then you get to expand your roster, uh, you know, later this week after school begins. Uh, but he wanted to have so many on pre or, or some players on preseason camp who weren't going to be able uh, to practice some, if not all of the preseason, just because of the leadership they provided. I think Torian Carter is certainly one of those. The whole hog football podcast is sponsored by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas, where you always get the best service and the best buying experience in the state. For all your automotive needs, shop Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers, where we guarantee you the best buying experience and best service after the sale in Arkansas. Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers. Pohawksports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at wholehogsports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. Whole Hog Sports. Com. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. Welcome back to the Whole Hawk Football Podcast. If you're in Fayetteville, join us on Wednesday for the Hugs Illustrated Sports Club. We're going to welcome Sam Pittman to the Hilton Garden Inn off of Weddington Drive. Listen to Coach Pittman talk about his football team. He'll do a little bit of Q&A toward the end of the luncheon. It's going to be a one-hour luncheon. Doors will open at 11.45 a.m. The program begins at noon, and we'll have you out of there by 1 o'clock, if you want more details about tickets, go to nwadealpiggy.com. That's N-W-A-D-E-A-L-P-I-G-G-Y.com. That's one of our sister websites, and you can find ticket information there for Sam Pittman on August 24th and Hunter Juracek on September 7th at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club. During our preseason podcast, we've taken a look each day at a different position on the Razorbacks team, and we're going to finish our Position analysis today with safeties. Barry Odom is the Razorback safeties coach, also, of course, the defensive coordinator. Uh, it's an experienced group of safeties that he's got led by Jalen Catalan. And, and we've talked about this before that, uh, you know, Cat Catalan, I think sometimes it, it just gets forgotten how good of a player he is. But then all of a sudden you look at all these preseason All-America teams, and I don't know that people are forget about him after all. I mean, he was on the CBS preseason All-America team last week. Uh, the AP came out with its preseason All-America team uh, this week, and and he was on that too. Uh, mentioned earlier that ESPN.com had its list of the 100 best players in college football, and he was ranked number 66. 
And at the safety position, I think everything, and, and maybe for the entire defense, if, if you really want to boil it down, uh, the the quarterback on the field is, is Jalen Catalan. I know Jalen is super eager to get back on the field. And I think Tom was the one that, that asked him point blank about that. Maybe, maybe it been somebody else. Just, you know, his excitement to get back on the field. And he was like, man, you best believe I'm ready to get back and I'll be ready for, for September 3rd. He's been that way for months. Like, I talked to him at the that Old Spice School of Swagger Youth Football Camp in late June. And he just, he feels like he's, I feel like he's heading into this season with the mindset that he's like this unproven, maybe like red shirt freshman who has like five or six tackles to his name, maybe a pick you know, just kind of a largely unproven guy. And that's, I think that's, that's a good mentality for, for anybody to have, um, you know, they want to go make some noise and, and um, really play with a chip on their shoulder and prove to people that they're a really good player, but Catalan, like everybody knows what kind of a, a what caliber of player he is. And I think him being back, just, it gives Arkansas really, really terrific leadership at, at all three levels of the defense. Um, obviously that starts with him in the secondary, Simeon Blair's, I think he's a, he's a guy that's developed over time, but he's, he's really come along as a leader. And so that gives, I mean, good leadership at all three levels, but you got more than one leader at each level. I think that's important too. Um, I think all those guys listen to Cat though. Like he is the, I think he is the voice maybe outside of Isaiah Nichols or, or Bumper Pool on that defense. He is, he's the, the unquestioned leader and, I think he's in for for a really big year. You just hope that he can stay healthy. He has not exactly had the had the the cleanest track record in terms of that. Just because he plays so hard um, on every single snap. But um, I think Barry Odom is more than happy to to have him back. Yeah, I think the leadership that you were talking about that they're getting from Catalan and Simeon Blair is. Um, pretty invaluable. I think last year the team was kind of led by Grant Morgan and Hayden Henry. And so losing both of those guys, I think there's a void there that needs to be filled. And I think that these two safeties on the back end are, are going to step into those roles. And I think Simeon Blair specifically is a guy that coach Odom really likes and even mentioned that he would love for him to become a coach one day. And so that just kind of tells you how, how well they communicate and how well they are, how, how good, good of role models they would be for the younger guys in that room. And then like last year when things were going a little bit sideways, when Cat was out, like I don't honestly, I paid attention obviously, but I don't know who the vocal guys in that room were. Um, you know, as long as Cat can stay healthy this year, I don't think there's a question about who's going to be the big boys back there. And, you know, if he does go down again, uh, I think that's where you feel really confident in like the emergence of, um, of Simeon Blair, Jaden Johnson's another guy that'll um that can come in and play with Tavius Barini too. You know, I think you just got a little bit more I think you got a little bit more experience in guys that are that are willing to to lead when 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 needed. Barini, the transfer from Georgia, he he's a player who we've heard quite a bit about in the last probably week or so. Uh almost I think I've heard it compared to Jaden Hazelwood, how Hazelwood and Brini both come in. I think that the spring is kind of a, you know, getting used to their surroundings and acclimation process. And now they feel a little bit more comfortable and, and they're producing more on the field. Yeah. I think, uh, I think somebody asked Sam about Brini the other day and that, that's kind of the type of answer I would have expected, you know, after the second full week, you've gone two and a half weeks of, of camp, I guess, to this point. Um, two scrimmages now. He should have his feet underneath him. And I think that's the case with Brini, Landon Jackson, and Jordan Dominic. And those are, I think, tr three transfers that you're really banking on contributing for you in some form or fashion. And Sam said that Brini's been making a lot of plays, playing a lot faster. Um, and then that, you know, you could throw him in the same boat with Dominic and, and Landon Jackson doing a pretty good job. Catalan said that he's been mixing with the ones and the twos. So you know that he's you know, he's in that rotation in the in the defensive backfield, which I think everybody knows that's probably is what's gonna happen. Probably gonna be the same with Dwight McLaughlin too at, at corner. Um but yeah, Brini's gonna be Brini's gonna be an impact guy, I think. Um because Cat 
Simeon Blair, one of those two guys, are going to have to probably come off the field at some point. Or, you know, when Arkansas goes three down front, bring another DB on the field, I would not be surprised at all if Brainy was was the top option there. You give him three safeties and um, a nickel and two corners. Brainy started some games on that Georgia national championship team a year ago, so you would you would suspect that uh, he'd be able to get on the field for the Razorbacks. They are playing him in a little bit different of a position than he played at Georgia, uh, but but you think that that uh, experience will translate. Jaden Johnson's a, a really interesting player to me uh, because uh, you know he showed some flashes a year ago. Uh, he's so big, you know. The, the the talk a year ago was was he going to outgrow being a safety? Was he going to grow into a linebacker? And I guess that could still potentially happen. But uh, the fact that he's playing safety for a second year in a row. Uh, leads me to believe that that that's going to be the position that they believe uh, that that he can play. It seems like there's a lot of uh, potential there, Scotty. I know you wrote about him in our our summer preview. Uh, just kind of give us a synopsis of him. Yeah, he's a guy. I think when he came to campus, that you know, I remember talking to Joe Fouché maybe last fall camp. And he got asked about Jaden and he said that Jaden is back there at like six, three, six, two or six, three and about 220 pounds, 225 pounds. I think when he came here, he was a little bit, like you said, a little bit of a bigger body and was curious if, you know, he was going to hold it safety. And, you know, I think he had a, he had a pretty solid season last year. He contributed in some, in some places, but I think the big thing this year is he's trimmed down a little bit. And he feels like he's more able to run, make plays, be active, um, you know, maybe track down some of those guys in the in the slot that um, Isaiah Satania types, you know, they have a lot of speed. He's able to keep up with those guys now. Also, you know, if he gets a chance, he can put a body on him and, and you know, kind of make a, make a statement, send a message to him there. Um, I think he was compared a little bit in high school to a guy like Cam Chancellor, who played for a while with the Seahawks, just a, a big bodied safety who would deliver some um some some pretty big hits. I think that's the kind of player Jaden was. I don't know if he still is. I would imagine he would still probably hit you in the mouth <laughs> if you let him. Um, but I think he's a little bit of a different player than he was last year, maybe a, a little bit more versatile. What what players do you think were we're missing at the back end, like guys who we're not talking about this time of year who might by the end of the season step up and, and be contributors, not necessarily starters, but just contributors who you're noticing their play. That's a good question. I think Malik Chavis is going to start at one of the corners, maybe the first game. Outside of that, I don't know. I think we, I think Miles Slusher is just a guy that kind of tends to get forgotten about a little bit just because of the the additions elsewhere. And um, he's not exactly, I wouldn't say, in a position battle. I think like the number two nickels that I've seen on the field have been like Trent Gordon. And I think Trent Gordon is probably a fine player. I just haven't seen it. And so I don't think that anybody's really pushing Slusher a whole lot, but I think he's I think he's a guy that's in a, maybe a more natural position at that nickel spot than maybe at, at safety. Um, he's able to, you know, use a lot, utilize his speed and maybe get sideline to sideline sometimes and um, really use the, the physical mindset that he's got to to go make plays. And I don't think I think him transitioning to that position. I don't think anybody's going to miss Greg Brooks, who's at, 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 at he's at LSU now. Excuse me. Um, I think I think Arkansas likes what they've got with Slusher. I think he's I think he can have a pretty productive season. Seems like maybe more of a, a a miss will be Joe Fouché, who's at LSU. You know, the player who I think is is interesting to me is Trent Gordon because I, I think they thought he was going to play for them quite a bit last year, and that he got hurt pretty early in the season. I think during the Texas game, and you didn't see him much the rest of the year. Uh, you know, you wonder how much number one did that injury affect him in terms of his development, and whether or not other players have you know come in and, and could potentially bypass him because they're recruiting, uh, you know, better talent, so to speak in the, in the secondary, uh, that's just a player who I think is uh, kind of intriguing. I don't see him being a starter, uh, but maybe he could be one of those contributors on the back end, especially when you're talking about uh, some longer drives. We will be back with another podcast on Tuesday as we continue to work our way through the Razorbacks preseason 
Arkansas will go through practice this afternoon. Sounds like the practices are going to be a little bit more scaled back as they finish up their preseason and get ready for their Cincinnati prep on Thursday. For Scotty Bordelon and Andrew Joseph, I'm Matt Jones. We appreciate you joining us. Hope you'll visit us at wholehogsports.com, and we'll see you next time on the Whole Hog Football Podcast. The proceeding has been a production of wholehogsports.com. Look for our latest podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.